And now I will reassume my position as moderator and reintroduce you to Kevin Gover, director of the National Museum of the American Indian. I love listening to Patricia tell the origin story of the NMAI. Um, and, uh, you know, most of us here are, are sort of uh, well-schooled in, in politics and the process, and many lawyers here, others who are involved in Indian policy making. And um, in some respects, we, we, uh, we, we take for granted that these things happen and that ideas move forward. Uh, not everyone a success, but, but many do make their way through the process. But I hope we'll always appreciate what an audacious idea it was that Senator Inouye pursued, audacious in, in a great many respects. First, to take up a place on the National Mall. Um, no one would have thought that, uh, that that would be possible, and not only do we have a place on the National Mall, uh, we have the place closest to the U.S. Capitol uh, among the Smithsonian Museums. And that's really quite an extraordinary thing. When I travel to other countries and meet indigenous communities um, in, uh, in Mexico, in Peru, uh, they are absolutely astonished that the United States established a museum about the indigenous people and that it has a place uh, uh, literally at the foot of the U.S. Capitol. It was audacious as well, this idea that you would require museums to return something out of their collections. That is near heresy in the, in the museum world. And yet, to us, it is so obvious that that was the appropriate outcome and that it should be pursued. Nevertheless, there were powerful institutional interests uh, opposing this idea that the museum should be required to, uh, to return sacred objects and, of course, human remains. Uh, to the communities where they originated, and yet it was accomplished. And of course, there were all these predictions that, oh, the, the Indians are going to pillage the collections and everything will be gone, we won't have anything left. Um, Rick West had a great, uh, a great observation um, when it was pointed out that uh, 2,000 items from, uh, from the collection that, that the Smithsonian inherited from George Gustav High had been returned uh, two tribal communities, and Rick said, well, we'll just have to get by with 798,000 things in our collection. And that is, in fact, the experience of most museums. Uh, far from pillaging their collections, what has actually happened, and perhaps Senator Inouye foresaw this, uh, I didn't, but, but he's smarter than me. Uh, what has really happened is it has required the, the museum world to form a very different relationship with tribal communities, a cooperative relationship, a respectful relationship, where they engage on these issues that are tremendously sensitive. Uh, and yet, um, we, uh, we, we see this happening all over the country, that museums, most of them, not every single one, but most of them have realized the enormous advantage to them of repatriation to the tribal communities. They now know more about their collections than they ever did before because they formed this, this um, cooperative relationship. So uh, all of these ideas, perhaps only Senator Inouye, uh, accompanied by some not, per, not uh, <laughs> no one to, uh, uh, to overlook, Senator Moynihan, Ed Koch, um, Bob Abrams, David Rockefeller, all of these people had a role in the establishment of this institution. So we inherit an extraordinarily rich uh, heritage. Um, and in fact, I should point out that the Museum of the American Indian High Foundation opened in 1916. So really, our museum is 98 years old, not just 25. Uh, and of course, we'll be celebrating that centennial in New York uh, in 2016. But we, all of that is to say we, we, uh, we inherit an extraordinarily uh, rich her institutional heritage uh, that, that we should not overlook. It seemed to me, as, as Patricia was pointing out, uh, Senator Inouye uh, wanted this museum to be a real educational institution that he realized from his early brief experience uh, with tribal communities that if people only knew, if they only knew 
what these conditions were, if they only knew this history uh, between the United States and the tribes, that their attitudes were very likely to be quite different when they encounter these contemporary policy issues where uh, um, Indians and their neighbors are uh, contesting ownership, contesting authority, contesting rights. Um, most people uh, would say, well, you know, why should these Indians um, have these sorts of authorities? Why should they have these resources? Well, there are reasons. Uh, there are historical reasons, there are legal reasons, there are valid reasons, but people simply don't know that. Why don't they know that? Because they've been taught an imaginary version of American history. They've been taught to believe in Indians that are imaginary. The Indians that are most, most uh, frequently seen in the popular culture and, by the way, in our formal educational system aren't real people, and they were not real people. And yet those are the Indians we've all been taught to believe in. And I include myself in that. I grew up going to public schools in Oklahoma and came to believe a lot of things that I've since learned simply were not true. And that's really quite extraordinary. So Senator in no way uh, imagined that if somebody, especially an institution as authoritative and influential as the Smithsonian, began telling the truth, that that was not an end in itself that that would eventually filter into the making of policy and that would result in different outcomes. And that is an extraordinarily uh, strategic um, uh, approach to what this institution should be. It also seems to me uh, when uh, Senator Inouye determined that the Board of Trustees for the National Museum of the American Indian should be majority Indian that that was, uh, I, I'm real curious about who the one that was that, that's opposing that, but maybe, maybe Patricia will share that with us later. I have, I have my guesses, I bet you do too. But, um, but he prevailed. And in fact, our, our board of trustees is, uh, uh, has a strong native majority um, that, that makes very important decisions about the directions that, that, that we take in the museum. So, for example, our repatriation program goes beyond what the statute requires. Um, the, the Board of Trustees made very clear that uh, we will do more than, than uh, meet the bare minimum requirements of the statute for repatriation. We will work very hard with tribal communities to return these things to them uh, if we can see any reasonable way to do so. And that is, in fact, the policy uh, of the museum. Uh, and so, uh, by empowering Native people, Senator Inouye almost certainly knew that the results of the work of a, of a museum, even at the Smithsonian, um, were going to be very different than, uh, than what we'd seen from more traditional museums. The other lesson that we really take uh, in, in, this, uh, in this generation of, of, uh, of the museum is that we need to be ambitious. We need to be as ambitious and audacious as Senator Inouye was when, when he uh, pushed forward with this idea. And to that end, uh, the future of the museum, at least uh, for the next uh, uh, few years, is going to really focus on that idea of education. And, um, and I, uh, by the way, um, have spent most of my life as, a, as an advocate for, uh, for the tribal nations, either as an attorney, as a lobbyist, uh, as a federal official. And, uh, and I had the same experience and formed the same belief that Senator Inouye did, that if people only knew, their attitudes about these outcomes would be a lot different. Um, I remember many times going to meet a county commissioner, going to meet a state legislator, going to meet a member of Congress, and certainly talking to judges and realizing I had to start at square one in educating them about Native history and why it is that we were bringing this curious assertion that this group of people who were racially Indians had a set of very special rights that no other American had. That is a, that is a tough sell to the uninformed. But if we can inform them, if we, if we had a generation of policy makers, decision makers, judges, legislators, um, who actually knew something about Indians that was true, then I believe that, that it can only work to the advantage of Native communities. 
And to make a long story short, that is what we're out to do. Now, as Patricia pointed out, this isn't the kind of thing that happens in, uh, in a couple of years, uh, perhaps not a decade, perhaps not even two decades. But over the course of time, if we can change popular understandings about Indians, if we can change what people know about Indians, um, then we can begin to have that impact and really uh, begin to have, a, have different sorts of outcomes um, when Indian rights are contested. We'll be taking uh, not our first step in this direction, but, but a very visible step uh, in this direction beginning this year, the 25th year uh, after the establishment of the museum, the 10th year after the opening of this museum, and that is with our exhibition on treaties. Uh, in an exhibition that we're calling Nation to Nation, uh, we will be describing the history of the relationship between the United States and the American Indian nations. And we do so, I think, unsparingly, saying that in the early days, when the United States was young and weak and a little bit uh, uh, bedeviled by its European, um, um, its European competitors, that they turned to the Indian nations for support. And so we describe the treaties that emerge uh, between the United States and the Haudenosaunee, between the United States and the Creek Confederacy, and say these were not giveaways. This, this was not the United States bullying these Indian nations. They needed the friendship uh, of, of those Indian nations, and they negotiated uh, and compromised and received uh, the friendship of those Indian nations. Now later, as we all know, as the balance of power began to shift, the United States began to make policy unilaterally and to dictate the terms of the relationship. Uh, and the results were absolutely catastrophic for, for Native people and for the Native nations. But finally, we point out that beginning in the mid-20th century, the Native nations once again, they had never given up on this idea of a nation-to-nation -nation relationship. They had never given up on the ideas that the treaties could be enforced, notwithstanding uh, a brutal history of, um, of, the, of the breaking of these treaties. The Indians always believed in them and continued to assert them and, and demanded that the United States uh, respect and honor the commitments that it had made a very long time ago. And lo and behold, uh, in the 1960s and the 1970s, we saw a very dramatic reversal of policy. We began to see uh, institutions like the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs, uh, even the, uh, um, the dusty old Bureau of Indian Affairs, begin to actually talk to Indians about what Indian policy should be. Not out of the goodness of their hearts, but because the tribes demanded it. And that demand began to be met. Until these days, we see a situation where virtually all policy affecting Native Americans is negotiated. Uh, I, it's, it's hard to imagine a major legislation uh, affecting tribal interests passing this, these days without the consent of a fairly considerable majority uh, of the Indian tribes agreeing to it. <coughs> and so we suggest that this is, in many respects, a movement back toward uh, the making of treaties between the United States and the American Indian nations. I could sit here and rattle off uh, a dozen statutes that call for negotiations between the United States and the tribes, between the states and the tribes, between different tribes. I could rattle off uh, another two dozen pieces of legislation uh, where the Congress is enacting a negotiated settlement uh, over a land claim, over water rights in, in, the, uh, in the arid west. These are nothing if not treaties. And we're saying because the United States returned to that form of policy making, Indian country is beginning to prosper again. And that that is, that is uh, how policy should be made. That is how this relationship should be conducted uh, respectfully, uh, by negotiation, and with the consent of both parties. But then we go on to say, you know, the story is never over. Um, the fact is the United States is powerful enough to say, we don't want to do this anymore. We're just going to go back to the old way and we'll tell you 
um, what's going to happen uh, to the Indian tribes. And so we say to our audience, each of us, Indian and non-Indian, uh, who live in the United States, inherit the responsibility for this relationship between the Indian nations uh, and the United States. And that the outcome is not something that happens outside of our grasp. It is our responsibility to produce outcomes. And so man, no matter who you are, you come into this museum and you're uh, a citizen of the United States, you have a responsibility for maintaining this relationship that is older than the Constitution. The very first promises the United States made were to Indian nations. And hopefully we can inspire the audience to, to accept that responsibility and say, I get it now. And so when I see something happening in my hometown where some tribe is asserting some right that strikes me as a little strange, at least now I have some, some perspective and some context for understanding that. Treaties is, uh, will be only the, the, um, uh, the beginning of this new approach that the museum will take. Uh, I will describe um, uh, very briefly uh, an education initiative that, uh, that we've been working on for some years and that we think is, uh, is very close to, um, uh, to, to becoming real. But uh, one of the things that, that I mentioned earlier was that um, the formal education system continues to mislead Americans and American students about the actual history of their country and about and certainly uh, those elements of the history that involve native people. Um, we don't think the teachers are dumb. We know that's not true. We don't think they're lazy. We know that's not true. Um, but what is lacking is the kind of material uh, that they can use in their classrooms to teach uh, an accurate history. And uh, we see it as our opportunity, perhaps even our responsibility, to begin arming teachers throughout the country uh, with the correct information, with information that is appealing to their students, um, but that also corrects all of the bad information that, that the culture continues to pour upon them. Uh, just a few years ago, we had some representatives from the Disney company here. And uh, they very earnestly were telling us how they want to do better. They want to see uh, uh, a whole different way. When they portray other cultures, they want to get it right. And we thought, that's great. You know, we, we, we're looking forward to working, working with you. The next night, Saturday night, on the ABC network, they showed Peter Pan, which contained some of the most nastiest stereotypical material about Indians that's ever been produced in the popular media. No sense of irony whatsoever that that's what we've been talking about, that that's what misleads people. If you, uh, if you uh, trusted the movies, um, you would come away with the notion, for example, that Pocahontas trotted around in a buckskin cocktail dress. Well, we know that's not true. Um, you would also believe, by the way, that she saved John Smith uh, from being executed by her father. Well, the only witness to that event that's ever been recorded, John Smith, in the book that he was trying to sell everybody in Europe. So historians have concluded that that was simply not true, and yet it continues to be taught uh, in the schools. And the greatest myths of all really continue to be taught in our schools. The idea that the Americas were a wilderness. They were anything but. And we know now from the mainstream research that there were quite probably as many people living in the Americas in 1492 as there were in Europe. Now think about that and how it changes your understanding of what happened next. Why was it that, uh, that the Europeans came and, um, and said, this is wilderness, this land is unused, and we're going to begin using it. That is a, 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 an incredibly destructive idea, but one that is deeply planted in the American psyche. Now think again about how different it would be if it were absolutely understood that the Americas were thriving, that, that uh, as one of my curators likes to say, Ameri the Americas were a happening place. 
with civilizations covering every part of these two continents. There was no part of these two continents that was unknown to the indigenous people, that was not part of the territory uh, of, of the indigenous people. And that there was no wilderness. Civilization had been here for thousands of years. Civilizations had risen and fallen just as they had in Asia, Europe, and Africa. And that, um, and that this whole notion of wilderness, wilderness is mythological. Well, that's the kind of information we want to begin putting into teachers' hands. That's the kind of information that you're going to start seeing uh, in our exhibition programs, uh, both here and in New York City. And, and hopefully um, that is the kind of thing uh, of which uh, Senator Inoue would approve, and that that squares with his vision of the potential impact um, that, this, that this museum can have. Uh, one last thing, and, and it's this, you know, you heard something about the history of the Smithsonian. Um, certainly a uh, uh, hundred some years ago, uh, the Smithsonian was right in there with, with all the other mainstream scientists uh, engaging in this race science nonsense and measuring skulls and ranking uh, uh, different races and saying these are the smartest, these are the least smart, two guesses on, on sort of how that ranking went. Um, and, uh, and it has a lot to answer for. Um, but the fact is, this is a different institution than it was back in those days. The fact is, uh, the Smithsonian has uh, changed a very great deal uh, about itself and about its approach to this material. And the Smithsonian has something that is just extraordinarily important to us, and that is the Smithsonian brand. It is one of the most trusted institutions uh, in the United States. It has earned the trust uh, of, of the American people. And now, uh, one of the things that we reflect on all the time is that we now have, we are able to call upon uh, that same credibility, that same trustworthiness uh, that the Smithsonian has earned over the course of the past century and put it to work for the benefit of the tribal nations. And I'd like to think, uh, despite the magnificence of our facility here, uh, the one in New York, the one out in Suitland, um, that, that the greatest gift uh, that Senator Inouye gave us um, was access to this authoritative voice that is the Smithsonian Institution. It is one to be used with great care and respect, but it is one that, that we do intend to use use frequently and to use to the advantage of the native nations. So thank you all for being here and, and we're gonna keep talking about this. Uh, I know I'll, I'll see you uh, and uh, we'll continue this conversation. Thank you. Well, what a, what a great direction forward. I know the Senator would be very, very happy with all that Kevin has said. I don't know if it's ever happened to you, but uh, uh, I just hate it when I say something wrong and then I don't know, I don't ever have a chance to correct it. Fortunately, I'm here again and I can say <laughs> there are actually six nations of the Iroquois Confederacy and as Kevin accurately said, the museum opened its doors on September 21st, 2004, not 1994 as I said. So there, my record is corrected. I hope I make no more mistakes today.